All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. This is session 10 in our class, Understanding the End Times. And the uh, title of this class is The Apostasy. So I want you to go ahead and turn your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. And we're going to look at what Paul said about the apostasy. Uh, we're going to spend actually the next, I don't know, three to four, we're going to spend the next four sessions talking about the, the apostasy that's coming. And uh, we just want to be, we want to be aware of what God's Word says as forerunners. We want to be able to uh, speak the Word of God to people to warn them of what the Scriptures say is coming. So anyway, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we'll start with verse 1. And Paul's writing, and you got you got to understand, when, when Paul was writing the book of 2 Thessalonians, many in the church thought, okay, the, the day of the Lord has already come, the rapture has already taken place, and uh, so Paul has to come in and, and cor bring a correction to the Thessalonians that thought, okay, this has already taken place. And so Paul's coming in, this is the context to which Paul's speaking, and he says, now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that would be the rapture, uh, in verse 2, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a messenger or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. And so in other words, what was happening was there was a letter circulating and there was people saying and people, maybe even visiting ministers coming in to the church in Thessalonica and they were saying the day of the Lord has already come, the rapture has already taken place and Paul says very clearly, let no one deceive you in any way. That's verse 3. For this, this is so important to understand. Here, here, listen to what Paul says. For it will not come, talking about the day of the Lord, talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ, talking about the rapture of the church. It says, it will not, let no one deceive you in any way, it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And I want us to take special note of that phrase, the apostasy comes first. It's the apostasy that comes first. Even, I, I believe, possibly even before the Antichrist is revealed for the man of lawlessness, there will be an apostasy that takes place in the church of Jesus Christ. And Paul's warning us about that. Now, I also believe there's going to be a great end time revival, Revelation chapter 7, coming up out of the tribulation where masses, massive numbers of people that no one could count saying salvation to the Lamb. And so I think there's, I think we, there's both that will take place in my opinion, but here we have Paul warning about the apostasy. He says, it is not, the apostasy comes first. The apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. And so that quote, if you know, we've been studying the book of Daniel, we've been looking at the abomination of desolation, we've been studying what the uh, Old Testament prophets have said. And uh, here Paul is drawing obviously from the book of Daniel, telling us the Antichrist is going to go into the temple of God, uh, it's going, that tells us that the Jewish temple is going to be rebuilt and he's going to proclaim himself in that temple as God. And uh, he's going to put a stop to the grain offering and the sacrifice offering. Uh, that we, we've, we've talked a lot about that. But so anyway, Paul's telling us that, that uh, the apostasy comes first. And so we're going to talk about what that means. The, the word apostasy means a falling away a defection, a revolt. Strong's Dictionary says it's a defection from the truth. I mean, aren't we seeing that today in the church? I mean, aren't we seeing many in the church defecting from the truth of Scripture and even saying the Word of God is not infallible or inerrant and Jesus is not the Son of God and all kinds of things going on in the church today. 
Uh, the dictionary definition of apostasy is the abandonment or renunciation of a religious belief. And so clearly there's a warning about to the end time church, and we're seeing it unfold right now. I think it's going to increase. It's going to definitely intensify before Jesus comes back. But this is talking about the church, some in the church of Jesus Christ falling away from Christ, renouncing Christ, renouncing the word of God as infallible. And, uh, you know, eventually it's going to follow the, some are going to follow the Antichrist. But Paul in 1 Timothy 4.1 gives us very clear warning. In fact, it wasn't just Paul writing. It was the Spirit prophesying through Paul. And Paul says, the Spirit explicitly says, now notice that, the Spirit explicitly says that some are going to fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. And we're seeing that even right now in what some are calling, they, they are deconstructing their faith, their, their so-called deconstruction movement that's causing many to fall away. And they're finding as they deconstruct, they really had no faith at all. But really what they're doing, this is, this is what Paul's telling us, really what they're doing is they're, pay atten they're paying attention to demons and they're paying attention to doctrines of devils and that there is a demonically empowered, energized movement that is taking place and is going to increase. And, you know, so much of what Paul was warning about, about the apostasy, is because there, there is coming a time, he warned, that the church is no longer going to be able to endure sound doctrine. They want their ears tickled. I mean, isn't that the truth of what we see in the church today and the, the rising of seeker sensitive churches that hardly even preach the gospel anymore, the watered down gospel, and they want their ears tickled is what Paul is what Paul says. And so they accumulate for themselves teachers that are in accordance with their own desires. They, they want their own hand-picked teachers, and that makes, and even with the internet now, it makes it so much easier to find the teachers we like to hear a message we want to hear. And unfortunately, a lot of what is being preached in what's called the church today is another gospel, and it is an ear-tickling gospel, an ear-tickling message that is not sound doctrine, and is causing people to depart from the faith which was once and for all handed down to us by the apostles to the saints. And so, you know, we've seen it. We see this watered down, seeker sensitive message for this audience that wants their ears tickled, where self is placed at the center of the gospel instead of Christ. Self is placed at the center and God becomes like a Santa Claus type figure who merely exists to bless you. Isn't that what so much of the church is? This bless me gospel. We want to be blessed. We want to be blessed. Well, don't get me wrong. I, I love when God blesses and he, he enjoys blessing us. He's good. But God does not exist to bless me. God does not exist to bless you. God is not some kind of man upstairs like a Santa Claus who just wants to exist to see that you're blessed and you have your best life now. God has an eternal purpose to conform you into the image of his son, to form you and shape you so that you would be like him, like Christ. And that's why, that's why he created us, that we might have his life in us and have it to full. And so as a result of this what Paul said, another gospel being preached. There is another gospel being preached in the land. There is another gospel being preached around the world. And because of this different gospel, not like the one Paul handed down, this different gospel with doctrines of demons, there is now around the world being worshipped in the name of Christianity, another Jesus. And I believe that's what we're really getting at here and when it talks about the end time apostasy is there is another Jesus that's being preached. Another Jesus is being proclaimed. It's, and then we'll get into this in the next session. But as I call him Jesus 2.0, he's heavy on love and heavy on grace and heavy on mercy and kindness, which he is all of those things. But he's but is rarely ever mentioned that Jesus, this Jesus 2.0, was never mentioned are the so-called negative sides of God, like his judgment or hell 
or, you know, that he's going to shake everything that can be shaken, or he's going to, there is a, a tribulation he's going to allow the church to go through. And so, you know, uh, that Jesus 2.0, that's light on all of the negative sides of God, but heavy on the positive sides. We're going to talk about that in the next session. But it, we, anyway, we're living in that day of the apostasy. But here's the thing we've got to understand is when we talk about the apostasy, the end time apostasy that Paul is unveiling, that Paul is revealing, is we've got to understand this is not something that's never happened before. There, it, it has happened before. History does repeat itself. And we have in the Old Testament a pattern of apostasy that we can look at this pattern of apostasy and we can say this pattern of apostasy is going to be replicated at the end of the age. Though very, that'll be different. Though it'll be, it won't be the exact same, but it is a blueprint and the pattern of apostasy that is going to unfold here at the end of the age. And anyway, we can, we can start this conversation with, with looking at Solomon or, or actually ancient Israel. And I would say the apostasy uh, if we want to understand the apostasy, the story starts, the storyline starts with King David. Now, King David absolutely did not lead Israel to apostasy. In fact, King David did the exact opposite. King David established in Israel, in Zion, in Jerusalem, what is referred to in Scripture as the Tabernacle of David. He took this makeshift tent and put it in Mount Zion and brought the Ark of the Glory of God into Mount Zion. And there, in the Ark of the Glory of God, he put 24-7 worshipers around that Ark of Glory. And he, he said, for, for, for not, we're going to establish nonstop praise and worship in the nation of Israel. And Scripture refer, refers to that as the Tabernacle of David. And so... You know, most of the Psalms were written, or a lot of the Psalms were written in the Tabernacle of David. If you ever read the Psalms and you see something like David saying, one thing I've asked of the Lord that I will seek is to behold the beauty of the Lord and to gaze upon him. He was looking at the Ark of the Covenant and the fire of God emanating out of that Ark. And as David was a worshiper, he was gazing on the beauty of God on that Ark, covered by the cherubim on that Ark of the Covenant. And he established worshipers and so the whole nation of Israel was centered around God himself. And, and, and if you study that, the, the kingdom of David, it is during that time when enormous prosperity came into the kingdom. And the borders began to expand like it was promised to Abraham. And, and so much of Israel's enemies were, were conquered because nonstop worship was preparing the way. And so that was at the height of Israel's wholeheartedly following God. But then came Solomon. And we know about Solomon. We know Solomon started well, and he became the wisest man on earth. And Solomon became this man that the kings and queens of the surrounding nations would go to him and inquire of him just to learn of his wisdom. And he wrote the book of Proverbs. And just, you know, you remember like the, the dream Solomon had. And God visits him and says, what can I give you? And Solomon wisely says, give me a wise and a discerning heart so that I can rule your people. And God gave Solomon an incredible amount of wisdom. But here's the thing about Solomon. He had a weakness in him. And that weakness in Solomon was he loved beautiful women. And there, you can imagine Solomon having enormous wealth because David paved the way and handed him enormous prosperity. There has never been more prosperity uh, well, not never, but in, in, the, in the ancient history of Israel than there was under David and Solomon. And Solomon gets this enormous prosperity, and then, but his heart is drawn away by beautiful women. And he begins to do what the scriptures forbid against. And he begins to uh, marry foreign women. And scripture actually says, I think he had, what, uh, 700 wives? I can't even keep up with one. So, I mean, I'm just kidding, but I can't even imagine 700 wives, uh, 700 wives. He had princesses. He had 300 concubines. I mean, so Solomon was led astray by his own lust and his desire for beauty. But what happened, here's what happened is the women turned away Solomon's heart from God turned away his heart from God. And so at the end of his life, Solomon had fallen from the Lord. At the end of his life, Solomon began to set up the Ashtaroth, Ashtaroth the goddess of, uh, talks about in 1 Kings 11, verse 5. 
It says, Solomon went after the Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the, god, the detestable idol of the Ammonites. He built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable idol of Moab, on the mountain which is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech. Molech is the, is the god who they would sacrifice their first, firstborn child to. Uh, the detestable idol of the god of the sons of Ammon. And so he, he says, thus he did for all of his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. So the apostasy in Israel began because Solomon lusted after beauty and he failed to obey God's law, which says do not intermarry with foreign, foreign women because they will lead your heart astray to follow after their gods. Now Solomon did that, but when we read this, we don't really get the idea that the apostasy was a corporate apostasy for Israel. It was mainly the apostasy of Solomon. It was mainly, Sol it was mainly Solomon's own apostasy. We don't get the idea of reading through it that the whole nation began to apostatize. But, that, but Solomon's apostasy laid the groundwork for the apostasy to come. And so we, we get now to the effects of that apostasy because Solomon... Uh, turned against the Lord, God said to Solomon, he said, your kingdom is going to be divided. After you, your kingdom is going to be divided. I'm going to take 10 tribes of Israel and I'm going to bring them into what's called the northern kingdom. I'm going to preserve two tribes because of my servant David and his loyalty to me. I'm going to preserve two tribes, Benjamin and Judah, and th this it, this, uh, this, Ju this nation called Judah, where Jerusalem is and the temple is, that is where I'm going to bring forth my promises and my Messiah. So because of Solomon's apostasy, the nation of Israel was split into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, ten tribes and two tribes. And so the southern kingdom of Judah would kind of go, would fluctuate some with revival and turning to the Lord, then apostasy, revival, and turning to the Lord, until ultimately... They, they turned against the Lord in apostasy and went into captivity into Babylon. We know all about that. But the northern kingdom never really followed after the Lord ever. In fact, uh, the first king of the northern kingdom, Jeroboam, set the precedent of idolatry that would lead Israel into apostasy never ever to recover. And as you, as you read through as you read through 1 Kings, you see, you see this, this phrase that says over and over, they followed after the sins of Jeroboam. They followed after the sins of Jeroboam. The kings followed after the sins of Jeroboam. And I always wondered reading that, okay, what exactly was his sin? What exactly is the sin of Jeroboam they keep referring to? But uh, it, it, it's real easy. It's, we, we talked about this in our first class in the Forerunner Call. Dad mentioned in the first session is Jeroboam, what happened is when the, when the two kingdoms split, Jeroboam, he had this uh, self-interest within him, this self-preservation within him. He did not want the nation that he was king over to begin to, to go to Jerusalem and worship God in Jerusalem and then eventually overthrow him as king. Jeroboam, driven by self-preservation, Jeroboam, driven by prominence, power, influence, and uh, wanting people to follow him, wanted, he, he, he did not want them to go to Jerusalem and worship God the way the Torah had prescribed. So therefore, Jeroboam instituted another version of Yahweh worship. It was not, it was not a, it was not full-blown idolatry in terms of we're worshiping Molech or Isis or Ashtaroth or Baal. This is another, another form of Yahweh. This, this is a this is Yahweh worship in a form that we like based on convenience and based on comfort. And so Jeroboam, he, what he did is, if you, read, if you read 1 Kings chapter 12, you can see it. But um, what Jeroboam did was he took and he created a golden calf that he called Yahweh and he had placed it in the, the, the city of Dan and he placed another, he, re, he took another golden calf and he placed it in Bethel and he said, he said to Israel, said, is it too much for you, in 1 Kings 12, 28, is it too much for you to go up to Jerusalem? Behold your gods, O Israel. Behold, and if you actually look at it, it's Elohim. Behold your God, O Israel, that you brought up from the land of Egypt. 
This is almost an exact quote of what uh, Aaron said in the Exodus when the children of Israel said, we, you know, we want a God. We can't relate to this God of thunder and of fire and of loud blast of trumpets. And he's too confrontational. He's too intense. He's too demanding of us. What he's asking of us is too much. We, we, don't, we want another version of this God. We want a version of, of, the, of Yahweh to our liking. And that's basically what Aaron created. He didn't create another God for them to worship. He created another version of Yahweh, another Jesus, so to speak, if we apply it in our day and our context. And so Jeroboam did the very same thing Aaron did. He created another form of golden calf worship, another Jesus for Israel to worship. It wasn't, a new, it wasn't uh, another God. It was another Jesus. It was another Yahweh. It was another God. It was another version of the same God. And, and so it was a perverted form of worship. And so Israel really thought they were doing what God wanted. But all of this... All of this was driven by Jeroboam's own internal desire as a leader to build his own kingdom. And so he gave the people a God they wanted based on the li their own liking and their own uh, convenience and comfort. You don't have to get on a caravan and drive all the way down to Jerusalem. You don't have to, you don't have to pay a price and sacrifice. We're going to have our own priest. Even though the Torah said it must come from the Levitical priesthood, Jeroboam ignored that. We're going to have our own feast days, even though the Torah said, uh, did not prescribe that. And so it's an, it's an entirely different version of, the, of worship to Yahweh. And so that's Jeroboam's worship. And so he led all Israel astray. And so if, as you read through 1 Kings 15... What you find, and here's one example, 1 Kings 15, verse 34, talking about the kings who would follow after Jeroboam. It always says, they walked in the way of Jeroboam and in his sin, which made Israel sin. In other words, Jeroboam's sin was established by Jeroboam and then passed down to, from one king to the next, to the next, to the next. Now, if we apply Jeroboam's context to our day, what we see is is Jeroboam is much like the church today. Jeroboam is so much like the church today. In the church today, it's not that we're, we're calling Christians to go, they're not, leaders aren't calling Christians to go worship Allah, or they're not trying, trying to get uh, Christians to go worship Buddha. They're trying to form Jesus into an idol. They don't say it's an idol, but it's a, a, a form of Jesus that's fashioned together by cherry-picked verses of Scripture, the good things we like about him, the things that are, we're kind of embarrassed about and we're, we don't really want people to know we believe, like his judgments and his demanding lordship and his confrontation towards our sin and those kinds of things. We're going to leave that out. We're going to be heavy on grace. We're going to be heavy on kindness, heavy on love, heavy on tolerance. Well, what's happened is just like Jeroboam, many leaders are committing the very sins of Jeroboam and they are, they are preaching another Jesus, just like Paul warned about to the Corinthians. This is just like in the apostasy of Israel, the preaching of another Jesus, the preaching of a different gospel, the preaching of a different spirit, this is going to lead, just like in the days of ancient Israel, to state-sanctioned idolatry that is another god. And so Ahab and Jezebel are the prototypes of this. After king after king that followed after Jeroboam, after they, they led Israel into the very same apostasy of Jeroboam, along comes Ahab and Jezebel. Ahab, being this political maneuvering king, <clears throat> he married... Jezebel because of the political advantages that would give him. But here's what happened with that marriage is Jezebel brought in an incredible amount of baggage into their marriage. She brought in witchcraft. She brought in Baal and Asherah worship. She brought in all this false gods into the marriage and into Israel. And so what happened was Ahab and Jezebel they, they took the sins of Jeroboam to an entire, entirely different level. 
They no longer were worshiping Yahweh in a different version and in a different form. They were worshiping Baal and Asherah. Asherah. They were worshiping these two gods who behind these two gods, if you really study it, behind these two gods were strong and powerful demons. So Ahab and Jezebel were actually turning Israel not just to another version of Yahweh, but to actually demons behind the two idols. And because of that, it became a state-sanctioned state religion that brought a cloud of darkness, a cloud of perversion, a cloud of lawlessness, a cloud of apostasy into the nation of Israel. And that's when God brought Elijah to confront that nation. And he said, he, you know, you know the story of Mount Carmel when when the prophets of Baal and Asherah were gathered together and they were trying to call fire down from heaven and, and, and Elijah was saying, if God is God, worship him. If Baal is God, worship him. We're, we're, we're coming into that very same place. And, you know, there's a huge difference between Baal and Asherah worship and worshiping Yahweh in a different version. Because Baal and Asherah worship were worshiping a de demons. In fact, if you go when you study the the terrible religion of Baal and Asherah worship. You know, in Baal worship, it was, and we talked about that mentions in the first session. In Baal worship, it was common for the worshipers to sacrifice their firstborn son to, to Baal. And as you can just imagine, the mother is screaming in horror as the baby is being sacrificed into the belly of Baal. And the, the Baal worshipers are, they're cutting themselves, they're practicing witchcraft, they're dancing, shrieking, and doing all these things to try to summon this demonic being into action. It's just, I mean, just a fully, totally demonic. And then alongside this child sacrifice was ritual prostitution and even homosexuality. See, what happened was the, the, the ancient people that day believed Baal and Asherah were uh, were like, when they came together in, in ritualistic sex, their their, what it would produce would produce a harvest in the land and prosperity for the nation. And so what would happen in that, in that worship of Baal and Asherah is you would have a male priest and a female priestess, and they would, they would uh, symbolically represent the sexual union of Baal and Asherah and, and commit sex in the, in the temple, in the temple of Baal, and through that temple prostitution, they believed that would then cause Baal and Asherah to bless the nation with prosperity and harvest and things like that. And so this is, I mean, you can imagine the apostasy that, brought, that Israel came under. Here's the thing, is, is uh, this form of demon worship, worshiping another god, uh, energized by demons, this form of apostasy brought in this incredible lawlessness gross sexual perversion, idolatry that we've never, that Israel had never known or seen. And, and so anyway, it, it brought in an incredible work of demonic power into the nation of Israel. And I believe that that is the precedent. That is what, that is what we're going to see unfold at the end of the age is, is the sins of Jeroboam, the preaching of another Jesus is ultimately going to lead to a universalism. It's ultimately going to lead to the harlot Babylon, the end time Jezebel, bringing in an entirely different form of worship that's going to be state-sanctioned, government-led, that's going to force people to worship uh, God, so-called God in this certain way. And so that's what we see. So we see the apostasy comes first. The apostasy comes first. But I think when I think about what Paul said... When he's talking about the apostasy, I think about the, the, the apostasy, the end time apostasy, the end time falling away, much like is going to pattern Jeroboam, it's going to pattern Ahab and Jezebel. But I see it in three phases. I, I see it in the first phase is we're living in it right now is it's patterned after Jeroboam. It's patterned after through doctrines of demons, deceitful spirits, the preaching of another gospel, ear tickling messages, is that uh, self-serving ministers are giving the people, their audiences, what they want as they're fashioning a Jesus into their own image. And I believe this Phase one of the apostasy is the presenting of another Jesus. And we're going to mention that. We're going to talk more into that in the next session. 
Um, phase two, then, once the seventh kingdom begins to be more established and grows in maturity, as we're going to see the harlot city rise up and her, her religion is going to be, her false religion is going to be exported to the nations. I and mean, we've already are seeing that right now with the Pope, Pope Francis. And we, we, we uh, mentioned that in an earlier session where he released a video in 2016 of, of a Buddhist and a Muslim and a Jew and a Christian basically saying, we believe in love, we're worshiping, we're, we worship God in our own way, we worship God in our own unique style. And, but this is being promoted by the Pope saying, all roads basically lead to God, it's universalism. And so I believe phase two of this apostasy will be state-sanctioned universalism led and promoted by Rome, the harlot city, that's going to intoxicate many, many in the nations that will prepare the way for the worship of the Antichrist. The goal of the enemy in this is to make the nations drunk and even God's people get caught up into it. Even, God's, even, even followers of Christ are dr going to drink this wine of idolatry. And that's why God's thunders in Revelation 18.4, Come out of her, my people. Come out of her, my people. Do not participate in her sins because her sins have piled up as high as heaven. So many in the church are going are to uh, play the harlot with end time Jezebel. In, in fact, in, in, in Jesus' message to the church of Thyatira, he says, those who commit adultery with Jezebel will go into great tribulation. I believe he's foreshadowing the, the great tribulation, the last three and a half uh, years of the age, that those who are committing adultery with Jezebel are going to go into the great tribulation. And so, anyway, that's phase two. We're going to get into more in that in, the, in another session. Phase three is going to commence three and a half years before Jesus Christ comes back. When the Antichrist and the Ten Kings, they burn down the city of Rome, they burn down Harlot Babylon. We've talked a lot about this because the Antichrist, we, we just read the scripture, he does not want a rival. He does not want any competition. He wants to eliminate the competition. He wants to monopolize the worship. So he is the one that is getting all of the worship. And behind the Antichrist will be the dragon, will be Satan, will be the serpent of old, who has always longed for the worship for himself. And he's going to get rid of every rival. He's going to get rid of all competition so that he alone receives the worship that he wanted and has wanted since he fell from heaven. And so, anyway, we talked about that, that three and a half years before Jesus comes back, the ten kings and the Antichrist, they're going to burn the harlot city. And as they burn that harlot city, the seventh kingdom is going to end and the eighth kingdom is going to begin. And this eighth kingdom will be a, a religion that has no tolerance. It's either you, you convert to this religion of the Antichrist or you die. You bow your knee to the Antichrist or you die. You take the mark of the beast or you will not be able to buy or sell. And so many Christians, this is, this is where the apostasy goes to another level. Many Christians who have been intoxicated by the harlot Babylon and they have drank, drank in her or drunk her wine, they're not going to have the discernment to see what's happening, especially when the Antichrist is performing signs and wonders and the false prophet is performing signs and wonders. There's going to be a number of Christians, once loyal followers of Jesus Christ, who are going to renounce Christ and they're going to follow the Antichrist when the apostasy goes to an entirely new level at the end of the age. And so we need to understand all of those things. And just here... Just to summarize here, I've got on page, page four of the notes, the apostasy, just to help you kind of see the time frame here, um, is phase one of the apostasy, which we're going to go into detail in the next session. Phase one of the apostasy, the preaching of another Jesus, the preaching of a different gospel, that has been underway for, for probably several decades now. Um, I mean, it's always, been, it's always been in place, but it has in, intensified for sure over the last couple decades. So we're currently in this phase one of the apostasy. Phase two of the apostasy, in, as the seventh kingdom begins to mature and expand, as the harlot Babylon begins to come to ascendancy 
and will go into greater ascendancy when the Antichrist brings her to prominence like she's never known, is, is we're going to see at the beginning of the, uh, of the signing of that peace accord with the Antichrist, with the, between the Jews and the Arabs, I believe it's going to be universalism that Jews, Christians, and Muslims, we all worship the same God. They're going to, that's going to be what's going to pave the way to make this peace treaty much more acceptable because that peace treaty the Antichrist signs uh, even preceding that, is gonna, there's going to be some moment preceding that when the nations of the earth are going to say to the Jewish people, to the Muslims, hey, we worship the same God. Why not you on the Temple Mount? You've got your mosque. You know, how about you let us build our temple? You worship God your way. We worship God this way. I believe that even before the Antichrist, there's going to be a movement that's going to allow the Jewish people to rebuild their temple. And the Antichrist is going to allow them to resume temple sacrifices. But it's, it's, it's universalism that's preparing that way. And so th then you, you get to the, the phase three of the apostasy when the Antichrist destroys Babylon, the harlot Babylon that has made the nations drunk with the wine of her, her immorality. And then he sets up the eighth kingdom and that will be the beginning of the great tribulation, the last three and a half years of the age. So with this overview in mind, um, we're going to take a much more detailed look at phase one, phase two, and phase three of this apostasy because uh, there's a lot of detail to look at. So anyway, we're going to wrap this session up now. And uh, anyway, we'll then go into more detail in the next three sessions.